<laughs> As James mentioned discipline, and I went like this, I realized I really am German. Sensemann. <laughs> 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 So um, I am speaking today about the second paramita, discipline. And this is the last of the six we've heard about. We had wisdom schmisdom. Mark talked about generosity. June talked about patience, which she assures us she is practicing diligently. <laughs> and. Uh, you spun that to tolerance, and that was really timely. So we've had talks, this is the um, last of the six, although it's the second of the six. And <clears throat> originally when I thought I would talk about discipline, I thought, well, gosh, I know from discipline because I make art every day, and I have for 65 of 69 years. And I also thought, I want to put some art up to distract from me, so I hope you're looking at my rocks. Um, and before I start this, I would like to tell you a bit about the rocks, okay? Um, these are gouache on paper. That's opaque watercolor. And the rocks are over there on the altar, a few of them. So um, what, what artists do is make art really about one of two or both things. One is ideas, and the other is, I mean, testing ideas. And the second one is testing ourselves as artists. I think. Really, that's the bottom line. And for these paintings, last spring, 14 people I knew, including my close family, moved. Um, and some of them moved twice. And I was the only one among my closest family and friends who didn't move. And so um, I took a trip and picked up a rock, and I thought, I think I'm going to paint rocks. And when an artist starts a series, she or he doesn't always know what it's about. It's just an imp impulse. It's not the muse, but it's some vague idea about what am I going to make art about? And so I realized actually the other day in preparing this talk that painting the rocks was about being steady. I felt a certain internal pressure and desire to be steady as a rock while everybody else was moving here and there. Uh, the second reason I did these is because every now and then I practice realism or representation because I want to see if my hand can still do it. Um, I could draw anything by the time I was nine. So now, as an aging person, can my eye and my hand coordinate? Neurologically, can I do this with a tiny brush? So I test myself every year or so. Can I still draw? And um, so that's why these are here. So I'll save a little time at the end if you have any questions about them. It's part of a series. Um, I should also say that I had friends give me rocks, send me rocks, and I started by tracing the rocks. So they are the size of the rocks. They're a little hyperbolic, but that's my prerogative <laughs> to amp them up just a tad. Um, OK, so backbone smackdown. <laughs> That is my <laughs> subtitle for discipline. Mm. <laughs> this requires a spine that is erect. Um, discipline, however I found out, is not simply work. 
discipline for a Buddhist means ethical conduct. This is morality. This is the big M of morality, being a moral, ethical, upstanding, upright person. So then after I realized that, I thought, well, gosh, this is not a very interesting talk. <laughs> what do I know about ethics? Um, it's dry. This just doesn't, it's like, OK, be good, do good, save all sentient beings. End of talk. That's it. <laughs> a really short Dharma talk. So I started spinning subtitles. And I'm going to read you the list of subtitles. And then I will loop back to each one. So Backbone Smackdown, Sheila, the second paramita. Standing upright, lean on me, stand by me. And if I had a soundtrack, we would do lean on me, or however that goes. <laughs> Bow, vow, row the boat to the other side. That's action. Washing bowl, raking sand, cleaning windows. Here at CLMC, <laughs> cleaning windows. Next one, nose to the Dharma wheel. I was thinking nose to the grindstone. But that didn't make sense. So it's nose to the Dharma wheel. And I borrowed something from Pink. Are we all we are? Next one. I do, or no, I do. I might. I'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next one, the brave and the free. To do or not to do? Why and why not? Next one, bottom up, inside out, the body's wisdom. Being a good nobody. <laughs> I borrowed that from Norman Fisher, sort of. So, <laughs> Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's familiar. Some of us might have heard, pretty is as pretty does. <coughs> Madeline Kahn in Young Frankenstein, although this had a kind of racy implication, verk, verk, verk. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> um, and the last subtitle for this talk is, I'll do it my way for all of us. <laughs> so, um, we are going to, before I even talk, if, if you have a piece of paper and a clipboard, I have six questions to ask you. And I'll give you mm, about a minute each. OK? And so you know this talk is about discipline. You know discipline in the context of our practice means ethical conduct. So that's a setup. But uh, about a minute, and you can write, draw a picture, make a note, as you wish. So. With so much time. Yeah, about a minute each. <laughs> So this is not a drawing course. But um, the first question is, when did you learn about, go back, Ray, go back to childhood, if you can here. When did you learn about morality? When did you learn about morality, ethics, proper conduct? Oh, no, I'm going to give you one at a time. Okay. Thank you. So first one, when did you learn some notion about conduct?
Okay, I'm going on to number two. You can come back to this if, if something occurs to you. Number two, can you recall doing something, killing, stealing, lying, gossiping, when you were a child? Did you rectify it? And how? Number three, did you have a conception of heaven and hell? And from what source? Did or do? Uh, did. We're still back in childhood. Oh, okay. And then we'll bring it forward. The second did you have a conception of heaven or hell? Mm -hmm. And from what source? Okay, yeah. Can you think, now this could um, perhaps teenage, childhood, teenage, as you wish. Can you think of a time in which you experienced ethical con, this is awkwardly. Can you remember someone being ethical? Can you remember a time in which you experienced ethical conduct of someone in some situation. As a teenager. Yeah, well, I think teenage would be childhood, teenage, young adult. Next one, what is your understanding of karma? What is karma? Now. now. And the last one is, what does your body tell you about decisions you make that have a, a bearing on others? Did you repeat that? Yep. What does your body, or how does your body, tell you about your decisions that have a bearing on other people? You have a decision to make that has to do with somebody else. What does your body tell you? So what I'd like to do, um, if you're whomever, if you're willing, let's um, talk about these for a few minutes before I get on with discipline and ethical conduct specifically. 
So um, would anyone care to share number one? What did you learn about morality or ethics? When, excuse me, not what. When, what, when did you get some notion about conduct? Carol's hand is up for every <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> I was always trying to grab a spot. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I can go. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> I put actually, I, I kind of grabbed onto proper conduct when you said that. Uh huh. So I got that very young to be a quote unquote good girl so that my mom wouldn't go silent. Mm. Mm. Could you hear that yeah. over the, yeah, yeah. yeah. interesting. Anybody else have good girl? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good girl, but I, I, wrote, I, I would say I was under five because I had first generation Italian parents. And I didn't really think about this until I was much older. They were like, why was this? Because that's another set of circumstances I love. But they absolutely led by example. There wasn't that much of normal lives, but they, are so, they were so true to they walk the walk. And they were never. I can't tell you ever deviated from that. Ever? I oh. never can be, I cannot tell you that they ever deviated from that. And it wasn't until later in my life, like, there's the reasons why, but post 9 11, I was in a company, and I started to meet unethical behavior, and I confronted myself, what is wrong with these people? You know, they want some things done in business, and it had nothing to do to punish the supplier. And I'm like, what? And then I started thinking, how, what, what if I miss my parents? I go, but have they never verbalized it? Second generation huh. Italian, you know? And I finally realized they absolutely let, they walked a very narrow path. And hmm. that's really where I learned it. Before hmm. I was concerned, that's where I learned it. Hmm. Somebody else? Pat. Well, certainly, I, you know, it, from parental influences when I was young, you know, the yeah. same kinds of, you learn how to act from how your mother responds to actions or things that she says. But I was, was thinking more about the explicit teaching about ethics. You know, and so um, because you know the stuff at home is often nonverbal uh, and probably more powerful. Yes. Because you're younger, but it's, in terms yes. of explicit, when I was when I, if you're Catholic in age seven in a Catholic school, that's the year you make first Holy Communion, and certainly you learn the Ten Commandments and the Six Laws of the Church, and you go to confession for the first time, so that you can go to communion. And all of that is loaded with all kinds of um, ethics and probably goes into that other question later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's the explicit, explicit mm. teaching. Anybody else on this one? Mike? Uh, when I was, as far back as I, well, when I was young, pretty much a whole time, it was just lots and lots of messages from many different places, often conflicting, and um, it was really a mess. Huh, a mess to untangle? Yeah, and then it would be untangled wrong frequently. Hmm. And, um, <laughs> there wasn't hmm. really, I mean, it was just so many, so many uh, messages of what was moral, what was good. And, uh, hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Suzanne? It's a little, a little um, broader topic, so um, I would say that I, the term ethics, um, I'm on the ethics committee at the hospital. And I didn't really understand what the term ethics meant um, because it was often just, you know, uh, used in, um, interchangeably with, you know, moral behavior. But ethics is um, from the perspective of um, the hospital, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, um, in doing research for this, of course, I looked up a lot of words, you know, Googled ethics, and I was amazed that about the top, the first 10 
entries had to do with business and exactly what you're saying ethical um, agreements within businesses yeah so what about number two um, I have a really strong memory of stealing a five cent piece of candy at a fair and feeling really guilty about it and not eating it and taking it back the next day you know it was still in its wrapper and <laughs> putting it back but I was um, really troubled by having taken that five cent piece of candy so who else has some memory about I know killings a strong word but um, it wasn't until much later that I realized those butterflies I put in jars and bumblebees you know I thought wow but I was much later that I thought that that was killing Henry Powerful lesson. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else on this one? Pat. When I was about eight or nine, I took a twenty dollar bill. You took a piece of candy. I took a twenty dollar <laughs> bill out of my mother's drawer. Mom never ever said anything about it. I figured up cooked up some sort of story about how I found it. <laughs> Uh, never turned myself in, and I never turned it in, and I never took it to confession. Ooh. And I was sure I was going to go to hell because of that $20 bill. I didn't go to confession about until I was in high school, and by then it was like, it's not something you take back to the drawer anymore. <laughs> <laughs> or, and, you know, the priest didn't say I had to go tell mother. Because I knew if I had gone to a priest when I was, like, to confession, like when I was, <laughs> at the time, it would say, take it back. Tell your mother, and I wasn't going to do that. So I didn't okay. go to confession. So, Oof. you know, I lived with that for a long time. But, you know, it was, I mean, it, and I lived with that for a long time. I mean. Mm -hmm. So that leads us to hell, doesn't it, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was living in the hell realm then. So, <laughs> so what are our early notions about heaven and hell if if we had them did you have a picture oh. in your mind oh. and how did you get it is what i'm asking chris okay. I, I, uh, I didn't grow up catholic but i grew up missouri synod lutheran oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah same thing, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh very heaven and hell were not concepts <laughs> they were real yeah. places From church, from my mother, from my grandmother, yeah, I definitely grew up with a, a sense that there were these places, and um, and 
be honest, it's, it was sort of one of my first, as a, as a child, it was one of my first uh, confusions about religion, because if God is all loving, then mm. what the heck is there hell, this hell for? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as a real place where you spend the, the, the eternity, you know, with no, sh with no help, hope of ever getting out of it. So, um, yeah, it was a very powerful, um, it was very powerful in terms of its visualization and it being real, and at the same time, it didn't necessarily motivate me in my behavior, hmm. which was kind of interesting. Hmm. What did it look like? Oh, or, oh, Mike, you hit. Oh, yeah, I was just thinking I grew up in Missouri, lived in the city of Luther, too. And, uh, <laughs> I actually couldn't reconcile that there was no evidence of either place, and I would pray for proof. <laughs> <laughs> Missouri. Yeah, and the, Isn't that the show me state? <laughs> <laughs> they were the more conservative uh, ah. branch of Luther, by the way. Hmm. You all didn't have pictures of heaven fire. and hell? Fire. What? Fire. I didn't have any. What? None. None? It's not really a Jewish concept either. Well, what about art history? <laughs> no, I mean, I guess I was drawn to paintings, and uh, I saw, I in a Presbyterian church, congregational, also, we didn't have imagery particularly, but I must have looked at books and been drawn to those pictures. And heaven seemed to be blue and soft and warm but not hot, <laughs> whereas hell was red and hot and the devil. And I was pretty drawn to looking at those devil images. Incidentally, there is a new book called The Penguin Book of Hell, edited by Bruce G. Scott. And I read a review in The New Yorker, and I bought the book. And it's not particularly well written, I have to say, but I don't read it before bedtime because it's all about <laughs> hell. Imagery from Mesopotamians who, they had a notion that we all go to dust. So that was, that's not too bad. Egyptians thought that if you lived the right life, you could have a good afterlife. But then it went downhill. <laughs> went downhill near, around the Middle Ages. Uh, the imagery, I mean, there was, of course, Dante, who was very explicit. There is an anonymous Irish writer from about 1250 who was writing about um, really what Dante wrote about, but it was big, mean dogs and fireballs and four fireballs, one that had to do with ignorance, one that had to do with defrauding neighbors, um, one, I can't, uh, one had to do with anger, and one had to do with greed. And I thought, huh, that's very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. So, um, all right, I'm going to move along here. So what's your understanding? Oh, did I say? Let's have a couple of um, number four. When, were, when did you experience someone who behaved ethically or you know, it's tricky. Do we say proper conduct? You know what I mean, morally. And this is moral conduct, not morality, exactly. Slight difference. Suzanne? I remember when I was in high school, <coughs> I do my, no one was home except for my dad and me, and I wanted to have my friend Julie sleep over. And my dad said, no. Why not? Oh, come on, Dad. I'm sure I said, no. And, and he explained to me, and I forget the word he used, um, but it, it was the in, impropriety or something of having this young high school woman sleep over when only my father was there. He was very hmm. like, what, what would not, well, he was also a lawyer, so I mean. <laughs> 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 but he was like, what, what looks, you know, what is 
Anybody else on this one? So I'm not sure. So when we say moral conduct yeah. or ethical conduct, and then I think about, well, what about doing the right thing? Is that mm -hmm. the same as moral and ethical? Let's say for right now, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So who did the right thing? So I, where I what came to mind was uh, Mr. Robelstad, who was a teacher I had in junior year in high school. Oh. And uh, uh, he was a great teacher, and he, he inspired me around history and intellectual thinking in a way that no other teacher had ever done up to that point. So to me, that's ethical mm -hmm. conduct. Mm -hmm. He was fulfilling his role and actually spending time with me one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. which I hadn't had much of that at all in my school. Mm -hmm. In a way, he's kind of a hero of mine. Hmm. Yeah, as an adult, I've looked back at my mentor when I was in graduate school, Richard Kallner. <clears throat> um, I was trying fast, trying to learn how to paint in graduate school because I switched my curriculum. My advisor trusted that I could learn to paint, and he invited me to be his apprentice and paint next to him in his studio one day a week. And for that, he paid me Japanese soup. But um, this is hard to believe. And I mean, looking back at this, his two easels were in his bedroom. He had a lovely wife, but she worked. She was never there. And I look back at that, and I think, he never, ever. I mean, it was all about painting. and. You know, I think, wow, good for him, good for him. So that was ethical, that was the right choice on his part. He had me, I've told this story, paint with my left hand because I'm neater than he was. And he wanted my hand to mimic his hand. So, um, but he was very kind to me and a, totally above board and made all the difference in my life. So what about karma? <coughs> What's your understanding of karma? Mike? Uh, mm -hmm. Cause and effect in the great web of existence. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Cause and effect in the great web of existence. Uh, we in our foundation class teach a second meaning of karma. Yeah, it's lodged in your body if you disown an emotion. Yeah. And, and what happens as a Well, I mean, let's say, yeah, if you um, don't grieve the death of a loved one for some reason, if you disown that, it could come back in your body somehow. And um, later. later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Susan, I was also thinking of uh, Mark's talk last week, and he, he mentioned the book Living by Vow, you know, that mm -hmm. karma just kind of rolls. <laughs> you know, it's what rolls throughout of all of everybody's activities, and we can get caught up in whatever is just happening. And so, whereas Living by Vow is making, trying to have some intention. Mm -hmm about how we live our mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to say a little bit more about vows in a minute. Yeah, thank you. So um, my, I'm going to move on now. I'm looking at the clock. and uh, we'll, But I think this is a useful worksheet that has to do with discipline in our context of ethical conduct, morality. How did we learn what we learn? And now, what do we do with it? How do we approach 
each decision, how many do we make in a given day? I would like to know how many times a day, whether we're driving a car or standing in line at the grocery store, how many tests do we have a day? I'm doing this. <laughs> how many times a day do we have the opportunity to uh, spine up and do the right thing? Spike Lee, that was his film, right? Do the right thing. All right. Right conduct. Right, right conduct. Yeah, it's it's up to. I mean, that's... And, and, and I guess you're looking, you know, you know value of what's going to happen. Or could I lose my job? So maybe, okay, that's nothing. Mm -hmm. That's nothing. I can figure that out. No, but I did it. Yeah. That's a good, uh, how, how could I live with myself? Right. Yeah, that's a good, good yeah. question. Yeah. So um, one, of, one of my subtitles, my, this bow, vow, row your boat to the other side, um, when I talked about virya, which is energy, a few months ago, um, I mentioned that for years I tried to paint energy using agitated brush strokes, really autobiographically, because I tend to be, I tend to have a little nervous energy, a little longing, a little yearning, a little, uh, I had an art teacher who called me copper. He was Tibetan Buddhist in high school. And I said, why copper? And actually, my hair at the time did have copper in it. But he said, copper is restless, waiting to become gold. You're restless. I mean, the old alchemical. And so I painted. And I did paintings uh, in the 80s before I decided to have children about the rays from Gabriel to Mary in pre-Renaissance Annunciation paintings. So those rays from heaven were energy. And I, so I spent years trying to paint energy. So when I talked about virya, energy, I was comfortable with that. But I've never done paintings about ethical conduct. <laughs> 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 so these are as close as I've come. A rock is a rock is a rock. Um, next one, nose to the Dharma wheel. So um, you do know after our talks on the Paramitas, and I should say Roshi is doing a series that starts in April, right? And he will go into depth on each of these Paramitas. But it's important to know that um, these paramitas are not rules, they're principles. And there is a very big difference. This is not external info putting pressure on us to do this or do that. These are principles to work with from the inside out. Um, for self-transformation in the service of others. And um, this is noble, 
noble behavior. I really love that Trungpa Rinpoche says over and over and over in his writing something about being upright. I mean, our practice to sit requires an upright spine. Gentle curve, not attention necessarily, not, but attentive, upright. And um, param means the other shore. Ita is to have reached. So, um, reaching the other shore with these paramitas. Um, okay, next one. I do, I, I do, <laughs> I might, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> um, this is about vows, and I missed Mark's talk last week. But um, we all make vows every day. And my latest vow on Wednesday was to adopt a puppy. And I have wounds to show <laughs> that she has sharp little teeth. But we make ordinary vows. You know, the first time I encountered the word vow, I, I thought, wow, this is serious business. This is life changing. Well, actually, adopting a puppy is life changing. I mean, I will, if she lives to be 12, I'll be 82. And that was kind of a daunting thought. 82? Wow, this is serious, adopting a dog. When I was at anti-cruelty, the counselor asked questions. She was asking me to make vows, actually. You know, she said, what if this puppy barks incessantly, eats your shoes, um, cannot learn to potty outside? What will you do? And I thought, wow, I'm, I'm really vowing here to take this dog forever. And what I, in answering those questions, she, they weren't exactly trick questions. She wanted to know if somebody's going to say, I'll hit it, or I'll kick it, or I'll lock it up. And I said, I think it depends on body language. And I felt myself taking it up as I answered the question, sitting up straighter. And I said, I will remove the obstruction, distract, stand up straight, lower my voice, and perhaps turn my body away from the dog and do this, given the situation. And I thought, oh, this is being upright with this puppy. It's discipline for me and for the puppy. You know, we're training each other in every opportunity, every minute with this dog is training for me how to be upright and consistent and strong. Um, so discipline, according to Merriam-Webster, by the way, I thought this was really interesting to weigh discipline and conduct through the dictionary through other sources, and then through our teaching. So Merriam-Webster, discipline is the practice of training people, my puppy is training me, to obey rules or a code of, con a code of behavior using punishment to correct disobedience. Hmm, punishment. Synonyms, control, regulation, direction, order, authority, rule, strictness, a firm hand, routine, regimen, training, teaching, instruction, drill, drilling, exercise, use of punishment. That's in Marion's dictionary? Mm hmm Yeah. So, next subtopic. Are we all, we are? So, in our teaching, Discipline is internal, intentional, ethical behavior. And it is according to our 
commitment, our vow to save all sentient beings. It's our vow that we make to be disciplined for others, for self and others. So it's aspirational. And I thought, well, bingo, there's, there's a difference. A Buddhist notion of discipline and vow is aspirational. It's not about punishment if you don't live up to it. It's what do I aspire to? What kind of human being? What is my responsibility as a human being? How can I craft my life to be an upstanding, upright human being? And as you know, we have that opportunity to try it over and over and over and over again. Um, in Buddhism, this is Shila, by the way. I mean, the second paramita discipline is Sanskrit word Shila. So I also looked up morality. So from Latin moralis. It's the differentiation of intentions, decisions, and actions between those that are distinguished as proper or those that are improper. Morality can be a body of standards or principles derived from a code of conduct from a particular philosophy, religion, or culture. Morality may also be specifically synonymous with goodness or rightness. I didn't mind that, the goodness or rightness part. Of course, one, if you're skeptical, we'll write according to whom. Um, and next subtopic, the brave and the free. So what did Dogen say about virtue? That's another word we can use for this topic, virtue. Um, and I came across an essay by someone, a scholar named Douglas Mickelson from the University of Hawaii in Hilo campus. And he wrote an essay comparing Thomas Aquinas with Dogen. They were contemporaries. They were not living in the same monastery. They were continents <laughs> apart, but 1,200. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how they would have taken each other on really well. I'm sure. So Dogen established an unwavering relationship between morality and enlightenment, and furthermore established enlightenment and zazen, sitting, as one and the same. Dogen said, to distinguish zazen practice from enlightenment is heretical. Heretical. In Buddhism, there is no gap between the two. Our practice is identical with enlightenment, so initial practice is the whole enlightenment. Discipline, morality, practiced inwardly, manifests itself on the outside. I like that a lot. And what are the three qualities of discipline as we speak of them in our foundation classes. The first one is exercising restraint, binding oneself. And one binds oneself without the thought of reward. The second one is cultivating virtue. And that has to do with understanding karma. And the third one is altruism, benefiting others. So exercising restraint, cultivating virtue to benefit others. Sounds familiar, you know? That's discipline. So discipline is right and it's brave. Next subtopic, washing bowl, raking sand, cleaning windows at the Zen Center. Um, this discipline factors into the Noble Eightfold Path, 
which is divided really into three sections. One of the sections is, has to do with um, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Those three are headed under Sheila discipline. Right speech, right action, right livelihood. Checking the clock here. To do or not to do, why and why not? And this is where this topic really did get juicy for me because this was the heaven and hell part. And I had tried to print Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights um, from 12 something, where he depicted hell really, really graphically. And that image, I guess I was 12 when I saw it, and that was like, okay. I shifted from being a good girl to, ah, <laughs> whoa, there are serious consequences. Um, and it was probably superficial that my consequences came from art, but here we are. Um, so you know the 10 precepts, of course, and they are interwoven. And not killing, not stealing, of course, you can frame them all positively. But they're all dependent on discipline, respecting others, speaking truthfully, cultivating a clear mind, i.e. not taking or giving drugs. It depends how you read these lists of 10. Um, let, me, I've, let me skip by that. But Buddhists love to count. And, you know, there's 16 of this, 10 of this, 8, 4, 3, and discipline underlies everything. They all, it's all interwoven. But without discipline, of course, without patience and tolerance, you know, they're all interwoven, but discipline seems to be fundamental. So let me read, uh, my mother did say to me, pretty is as pretty does. I don't know if any of you heard that. But um, I kind of got the message. I mean, I kind of got what I know she was saying as a tough, good, true grit Oklahoma Looking back, the word pretty is slightly problematic, but um, I wish she had said strength is as strength does. You know, that would be good. So um, Thich Nhat Hanh, let me read something. The seeds we plant contain the potential to grow when conditions support them. The seed of a magnolia or a redwood tree contains the whole life pattern of the plant, which will respond when suitable conditions of water, earth, and sunlight arise. A Chinese Buddhist text describes these seeds. From intention springs the deed. From the deed springs the habit. From the habits grow the character. From character grows destiny. So discipline and ethical conduct is an aspiration to be a person of character, whatever that means. I might have stated that awkwardly, but character. How do we develop character? Trungpa Rinpoche, fearlessness is extending ourselves between the limited view of no. There could be a good no, there could be a bad no. Such a sensitive warrior can go further on the path of fearlessness. There are three tools or practical guides that the warrior uses on this journey. The first is the development of discipline, Sheila in Sanskrit, which is represented by the analogy of the sun. Sunshine is all pervasive. When the sun shines on your land, it doesn't neglect any area. It does a thorough job. Similarly, as a warrior, you never neglect 
your discipline. And another topic, verk, verk, verk. Verk, verk, verk. Verk, verk, verk. You reap what you sow. <laughs> you get what you earn. You are what you eat. <laughs> if you give love, you get love. And in the words of Kurt Cobain, <laughs> if you're really a mean person, you're going to come back as a fly and eat poop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As we act, we become. Yes. As we act, we become. Mm -hmm. So I am just about on the limit here. Um, I will direct you to a podcast by Norman Fisher on discipline, Sheila, at Upaya. And it's called Being a Good Non Person. Part of this topic has to do with um, knowing when you are, when we are unskillful. And we might even think that was a bad decision. That was, that was a dumb move. That, not I'm a bad person. There's a difference. That move, that decision I made was unwholesome, unskillful. I can do better. I can do better. And I am going to end with Mary Oliver. If you don't mind, I'm going to loop back to some rocks. Stebbins Gulch. By the randomness of the way, the rocks tumbled ages ago. The water pours, it pours, it pours, ever along the slant of downgrade, dashing its silver thumbs against the rocks, or pausing to carve a sudden curled space where the flashing fish splash or drowse, while the kingfisher overhead rattles and stares, and it continues for miles this bolt of light, its only industry to descend and to be beautiful while it does so, as for purpose, there is none. It is simply one of those gorgeous things that was made to do what it does perfectly and to last as almost nothing does, almost forever. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> this is the book, by the way, that I have used for preparing for two talks. <clears throat> so Dale S. Wright, The Six Perfections. And what I like about it, he starts each chapter framing out um, the Buddhist perspective of each of the six. And then he goes on to make contemporary references. And by the way, the book on hell uh, by Bruce, edited by Bruce Scott, the last chapter has to do with Abu Ghraib, um, Guantanamo, starts with Treblinka, and then comes up from the 40s to the current, our contemporary hells, mass incarceration, of, do you know that one out of 101 people in the U.S. is in jail? That's what he said. So, um, anyway, any comments, questions in the remaining minute? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Pat? Also, when you mentioned something not being skillful, because, you, you know, I've found, I think it's, it helps us 
helps me if I do something rather than saying that was dumb. You know, I find it more compassionate, which is what June's going to talk about next week. But it's more, a little more compassionate to say that was not skillful mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's not a put down. Mm -hmm. So I always appreciate those those terms mm -hmm. of uh, you know unskillful. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like the, we're learning yeah. how yeah. to become better human beings. Yeah. It's not a the first definition you gave around discipline, it sounds there was like an assumption that we are we're bad. It just right. puts me off. Whereas the learning is like yeah, we're yeah. learning and we make mistakes, we stumble, mm -hmm. we pick ourselves up and we continue mm -hmm. on. Yeah. yeah. I also think about courage sometimes because uh, just to extend yourself more, maybe the situation feels a little less safe or whatever it is, but you don't know what to try. Good, then you've got what, that feeling, and you move on and do yep. it again, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. I find that sometimes. Yeah. That little bit of courage. Mm -hmm. One thing I didn't get to was focus the felt sense, but yeah. that's it. Right. When you have a gut feeling of. That was question number six. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we.